Hi, this is the Tropical Tidbit for Tuesday evening, July 21st. The thoughts in this video are mine alone, and in making decisions, consult the National Hurricane Center and your local weather office for the latest information. We're getting deeper into the hurricane season now. Things usually pick up by the time we approach August, and we're still here in late July, but we have more systems to watch over time, and we have two of them in particular today, a tropical wave entering the Gulf of Mexico and a newly formed tropical depression in the central Atlantic. We're going to discuss this one first. This is Tropical Depression 7, and has been tracking westward over the last couple of days. Kind of snuck up on us a little bit as models didn't really forecast this to develop, but yesterday it developed a well defined circulation and then overnight last night developed convection and has been named as of 5 p.m. Eastern Time by the National Hurricane Center a Tropical Depression 7 and this has basically been a tropical cyclone for most of today and has continued to get better organized as we've seen convective bursts periodically you can see one just before sunset here near the center of circulation which is located maybe a little bit northwest of that burst at the end of the loop and you can see the general semblance of rotation in the cloud field with some spiral bands forming uh, on the north and western sides of the system. So this is getting organized, very clear, well-defined system at this point, but still weak winds only about 25 knots from latest satellite data. Now, as this comes westward, what it will be struggling with is a bit of dry air. There's not a lot of shear at the moment, uh, but all day we've noticed that the thunderstorms have been a little bit pulse-like coming up and then collapsing and then refiring over and over with no very clear central dense overcast forming during the day as of yet. And this is because the Atlantic, as it has been most of this year, has been kind of dry out here so far, a little drier than average thus far this season, and TD7 will be struggling with that a little bit, um, generating enough convection to actually intensify as it comes west. But other than that, there's not a lot in its way for the next couple of days. After Wednesday, Wednesday night, it'll start to deal with some additional issues. And I'll show you kind of on the models what's going on here. This is the European model from 12Z this morning, and it now has the storm kind of initialized this morning. It did not see this coming. Most models did not. And uh, then you see it briefly intensify on day one. Uh, this is valid tomorrow morning on the Euro. And then it starts to weaken again on the model, broadening out a little bit by Thursday morning, and then opening back up into an open wave on Friday morning. And you might ask, well, what's really causing this? It's likely not dry air by itself. The system is too well defined for that to really be the case. But if we go backwards here, you'll see at the beginning that there is a little bit of a surge of wind to its north that I'm actually going to show you more on the GFS because you can see it better uh, on this uh, mid-level plot where the wind now is the, the mid-level wind and the color is moisture and we see TD7 here and there's this outline of uh, SAL or Saharan air layer, air that originates over Africa moving westward to the north of TD7. This is very fast flow in the mid-levels, 25-30 knot wind, and it's quite dry. As we go forward in time, this SAL surge, uh, I might as well call it, uh, continues to overtake TD7. And what ends up happening is after a couple of days, we get to Thursday and Friday, this surge of wind is very close to TD7, and TD7 is trying to gain latitude and eventually interacts with this fast stream of air. And this functions to do a couple of things. One is that it kind of tries to take TD7's moisture, which you can see out in front, and try to string it out a little bit and try to destroy the circulation by stretching it. And if TD7 tries to come too far north, right into the middle of this surge, uh, then it will experience that stretching. The other is that this is a very fast steering flow as well. So especially if TD7 comes far enough north, it will start feeling this push toward the west at quite a pace, you know, maybe a 20 knot forward motion perhaps toward the west as it approaches the Lesser Antilles in the Eastern Caribbean. And when that happens, especially when the circulation is small as it is here, it's very difficult for a weak storm to maintain a circulation that is closed off at the ocean surface because it's moving westward so fast. So having west winds on the south side is more difficult. And in addition to this, when you have these sal surges with these 25, 30, 40 knot winds in the mid-levels, there's always going to be some bit of shear here because the upper level winds are never going to be this strong. So when the mid-level winds are strong out of the east and the upper level winds are lighter, there's going to be shear there. And we can see that on the GFS as the system approaches the Lesser Antilles in the model, you see these very light winds at 200 millibars, the very upper levels of the atmosphere. And at first glance, this looks like a very healthy upper level high over the system 
system, and it would be if the system was moving slowly. But if it's moving westward at 20 knots during this time, well, that's about 20 knots of westerly shear. And that's pretty typical, especially in July in the Caribbean, where a trade winds are at their strongest on average, and it's not uncommon for systems to struggle as they enter the Caribbean at this time of year especially, and TD7 may be one of those. The big caveat to storms like this is that the stronger they get, the greater their chances of survival because a stronger, more robust vortex can survive some of those things like shear and strong steering flow a little bit better. And that's gonna be the key over the next while because if we look you know, at some of these models, the GFS does have a vortex approaching the islands, but a couple of runs ago, it didn't really have anything. So the model Models are kind of playing catch up because the storm is forming in front of our eyes and the models haven't really expected it. It's a system that they're struggling with because it's a little tiny, etc. Um, the Euro here, again, shows this kind of opening up and moving into the Caribbean as an open wave and it doesn't really get a chance to form again. Same with the GFS, same with most models, uh, except for some like the HWARF, which I'll briefly show here. Now the HWARF uh, takes this and uh, gradually intensifies it during the first 12 to 24 hours and then during the day on Wednesday really ramps this up here in the afternoon and evening into a stronger tropical storm. And then as it comes west, again, you can see the south surge screaming by to the north, 30, 35 knot winds here in the mid-levels to the north of the storm. This becomes hurricane intensity on the HWARF. Now the caveat here is the HWARF does have a positive intensity bias in situations such as this one. So maybe don't pay attention too much to the intensity on the age wharf but this is an example of if the storm were to strengthen a little bit more than current models expect the effect of this is that uh, a stronger storm will tend to track a little bit farther north so you'll note that the euro and gfs were kind of through the windward islands here perhaps even the southernmost windwards even south of barbados on the age wharf the storm is slower and farther north and so uh, if you're in the um the leeward Antilles or the northern islands don't necessarily write this one off. The current forecast is toward the south, but if we do see a stronger developing storm, this would be slower and farther north, so it's not something to uh, dismiss as of yet. The other interesting thing about this forecast is again, you can see the south surge and the uh, ridge associated with that here, big H, to the north of the Caribbean, again, facilitating these very strong trade winds. If the storm actually enters in here um, to the south of this high, this is a very kind of hostile flow for the storm to be embedded in. But if it is stronger early and a little slower early, then it may allow the south surge to get out ahead of the storm and push west. And then the storm is not located directly south of it, but instead a little bit more on its eastern side. And there is a weaker uh, part of the ridge uh, to the north here. If the storm is delayed a little bit and a little slower, it'll find itself in maybe a little less hostile trade wind flow as it approaches the Lesser Antilles. So these are some things to watch at the moment. Right now the h wharf is by far the most bullish and most models are still skeptical of TD7's chances to be strong or survive once it gets past the islands. But given the way it's been looking today, very healthy storm so far and I would, I would expect this to remain a storm on approach to the islands and if it's going to dissipate, probably more likely to happen after it passes the islands. That would be my estimate right now. And right now the National Hurricane Center forecast does keep this a storm as it approaches the islands. And again, this track is pretty southerly right now. And a weak storm will probably follow a track similar to this. Not really gonna get much farther south than this. Don't really see this passing much farther south than Grenada. Uh, but if it is stronger, again, this window up toward the north is still open for a stronger storm. So keep an eye on this, even if you're just north of the forecast cone in this particular situation. NHC does have this achieving winds of about 65 miles per hour at a maximum, but right now there is some uncertainty in that forecast given that the storm is tiny and there's kind of some some fragile um, interactions that it's going to have with its environment that we just talked about over the next few days a little bit of uncertainty with some of uh, with storms like this uh, so there could be a range of intensities it could be anything from a moderate tropical storm to something you know maybe more closer to hurricane intensity depending on how things go during the next couple of days uh, but we're still about three to four days out from this impacting the islands with right now the NHC showing this entering the island chain on Saturday. So we have the rest of the week to keep an eye on this as it comes west and uh, we're not anywhere close to having warnings issued for the islands or anything like that just yet.
Okay, so that's TD7. If we go back to the big view, we have a second system to talk about a little closer to the United States, and that's uh, Invest 91L. This is a tropical wave that passed through the Florida Straits last night, and this is a closer look at that wave here, now entering the Gulf of Mexico. And if you take a look at this, you'll see some of these low-level clouds coming out of the east rather briskly to the west of the Florida Peninsula. And then if you look down here, you'll see the flow is much lighter. It's barely moving, and so you can kind of get that semblance of rotation here. Strong east wind, a little bit of a lighter wind, not yet a west wind, but we might start getting one eventually as this comes across the Gulf. So we're getting a little bit of rotation here. You'll notice that uh, most of the convective activity and moisture is well offset to the eastern side of this wave axis implying that this was sheared in its recent past. And indeed it was, as it was interacting with an upper low when it was back here in the Bahamas a day or two ago. That situation is going to change here a little bit. If we look at the water vapor imagery, we'll see now the upper level flow. You'll see rotation again, but this time it's down here over the Yucatan Channel. This is no longer the surface-based wave axis, but the upper level low that has been interacting with the wave, which is positioned here. And because this upper low is now to the south of the system, it's imparting a little bit more of an easterly flow over 91L instead of a southwesterly flow like it experienced a couple days ago. And this upper level will continue to back westward as the wave moves across the Gulf, continuing to impart easterly upper level flow over the system. And uh, we can see the impact of this here. If we look at the GFS, uh, the contours here, uh, mean sea level pressure uh, valid at 8 p.m. tonight, and then the mid-level moisture and wind uh, with the wind barbs here. So you'll see the surface wave axis is in here, and then the upper level or the mid-level wave axis is offset to the east. So the wave is tilted with height toward the east. And if we look at the upper level wind on the GFS here, this is basically the analysis. There's the upper low to the south that we saw in the water vapor imagery, again imparting some easterly flow aloft over the wave axis, which is in here. And as we go forward over the next couple of days, we'll see this persist. And by Thursday morning, there's the upper low has come west. And we have, again, this generally easterly or southeasterly flow aloft. And our wave axis by this time will be somewhere over the central gulf. We can see what this does to our tilt, where here at the beginning, again, it's tilted east with height. And then as we go forward, as this marches across the Gulf, by Thursday morning, you start to see that the two trough axes become more aligned. This kink in the black isobars becomes a little bit more aligned. We start to see a little low develop here, and our mid-level wave axis is right over top. So we're starting to align more of this moisture with the surface wave axis. A lot of it is still back here to the east, but we're getting more alignment. And it's at this point that we may see a little more favorable environment for some development element to occur and some convection to occur over a developing broad low. Now most models agree this is going to be kind of a gradual slow process and nothing explosive, but as we approach the coast here, most models do show some kind of rotation trying to develop as this moves into what is expected to be eastern Texas uh, sometime on Friday or Saturday, depending on which model you look at. Uh, and we'll have rain up into Louisiana as well associated with a system like this. The GFS has been kind of hesitant to uh, form a closed low as this approaches the coast. The European has been a little bit more well-defined showing a closed low uh, on Saturday morning as this moves ashore. And you can see that develop here. If I go backwards, there's the wave and we see it become gradually better organized and then make its way to the coast. But again, hesitant to intensify, possibly due to a not moist enough environment or something. We'll have to see what this looks like when it's in the central gulf in a day or a day and a half. Uh, but this has about three days, if not a little longer, to get to Texas. And that's a lot of time over water, not something that we want to dismiss. Even if models don't show a lot of development now, that doesn't mean things could not change, as we're already seeing this trying to rotate. And it has a lot of time to try to organize over the next three to four days. So we're going to be keeping an eye on this at the bare minimum. Expect another round of rain coming into portions of eastern Texas and Louisiana as we head toward the weekend. And if this becomes any kind of actual development threat, you'll of course hear about it here and at the National Hurricane Center, which is giving us about a 40% chance of development into a tropical cyclone right now. We'll see if that changes over the next couple of days. Just kind of have to wait for these things to get organized. It's hard to say anything definitive before you have an organized circulation if we are going to get one. 
out of this storm. Okay, so that's our two areas of interest. Uh, we talked about TD7 will approach the islands as we head toward this weekend, and this wave will approach Texas during about the same time frame. Both systems have potential to strengthen over the coming days, so keep an eye on the tropics and your local weather surface for the best information for where you live. That's it for now. Thanks for watching.